Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. I'm going to start the sermon this morning with a little bit of a symbol. I'm just going to take that off. Today is Friendship Sunday. It's a Sunday where we're celebrating our friends and celebrating friendship, and we have made it a point to invite our friends to church. And that can be a little bit scary. It can be scary for the one who does the inviting, and it can be a little bit scary for the friend. What are they going to think? What are the expectations? We could all be asking those questions right now. So what I thought I would do is maybe show you one of my favorite movie clips, right? Lighten the mood a little bit. It's from an animated movie by Pixar. So let me set it up and see if we can watch it together. Right then. The meeting has officially come to order. Let us all say the pledge. I am a nice shark, not a mindless eating machine. If I am to change this image, I must first change myself. Fish are friends, not food. Except stinking dolphins. Dolphins? Yeah, they think they're so cute. Look at me, I'm a flippin' little dolphin. Let me flip for you, I know something. Right then, today's meeting is step five. Bring a fish friend. Now, do you all have your friends? Got mine. <laughs> hey there! How about you, chum? Oh, well, I um, seem to have misplaced my uh, friend. <gasps> it's all right, chum. Mm. I had a feeling this would be a difficult step. You can help yourself to one of my friends. Oh, thanks, mate. <laughs> a little chum for chum, eh? <laughs> Fish are friends, not food. It, it's a little bit of a reminder to us as we're celebrating Friendship Sunday this morning that we are celebrating our friends. We're not setting them up as bait to become church members. This is not a bait and switch Sunday. It's a celebrate friends Sunday, right? So we're looking at Mark 10, and as this text was read for you, you might think there's nothing about friends in this whole text. What, what are we going to talk about? And so I thought, because it's not very obvious, I would dive into the story and maybe work through it a little bit, pull out some things to pay attention to, and then relay a little bit about what it might mean with friendship. So the text starts with James and John, the son of Zebedee, and they come up to Jesus and they say, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. It's a little forward, isn't it? I mean, they're pretty, got, they got a lot of chutzpah, right? Yeah. Now, what we might have done instead, we might have said, hey, I need a favor, right? When we say that, what's our expectation? Our friends will do it, right? So we have a little bit of that hutz, but too. James and John say, Jesus, we have a favor to ask of you. Jesus says, okay, well, what is it? He might be wondering, what is it you want, right? And they say, we want to sit on your right hand and your left hand when you get into glory. Jesus recognizes they don't know what they're asking. They don't even know what the place of the right hand and the left hand mean. But did you notice, he doesn't criticize them. He doesn't mean them. In fact, he asks them a question. He opens up the possibility that they might be able to learn what it means. So he says to them, are you able to drink the cup that I have to drink? To be baptized with the baptism that I will be baptized with? Now the sure sign that James and John don't know what Jesus is speaking about is they say, oh yeah, we could do that, sign us up. Right? But Jesus then says to them, you're not kind of getting it. Right? And, and for us, we don't necessarily initially get that either because we're not sure what cup and baptism mean. What is that actually? It's something of an idiom that means something else. You know, when we say it's raining cats and dogs, do we literally think cats and dogs are falling out of the sky? No, of course not. It's an idiom. It's an idiom representing a heavy rainfall, right? So the, the cup and baptism are an idiom too. When we look at the rest of the Bible, we can begin to understand 
what the context tells us and what these idioms mean. So Psalm 75 verse 8, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, says that the Lord holds in his hand a cup of foaming wine mixed with spices. And he will pour this cup out so that all the wicked must drink it down even to the dregs. The cup means punishment. Punishment. So when Jesus says, will you be able to drink the cup that I drink? What he is saying is, I will drink of the cup designated for the many disobedient, and I alone am able to drink it all down. Now, what about baptism? We're a little more familiar with baptism, but we tend to think of little precious babies and sprinkling water, and it's sort of a lovely ceremony that we love. But what Jesus is referring to baptism is he's actually talking about how his life has been anointed for his death. His life has been anointed for his death, and in his death, he will be raised up to eternal life. What Jesus is saying here is that my baptism is something that leads me into death so that I can cleanse all of you who cannot face that alone. I will take what you cannot so that you might be lifted up into new life. So that's interesting. And then Jesus ends by saying, sorry, right hand, left hand, you think those are places of power and importance, privilege? You can't have those places. They're designated for the ones who only God knows. Right? So then the story kind of continues, and as you might imagine, right, what do the other ten think about these two? What's this question about? How come you get to ask about places of privilege and importance. And they get really kind of upset. You know, Jesus hears them arguing, and then he says to them, my kingdom and following me is not about the kind of power and importance and privilege that you folk are arguing about. My kingdom is not like the world. My kingdom, in fact, is upside down. Because those who want to exercise power and leadership will be servants. Now we see remnants of that in our lives. What do we call our elected politicians? Public servants. Because it's not supposed to be about power and a particular lording over it of leadership. It's about serving the citizens. Jesus has set that into our minds in such a way that the kingdom of God is about exercising that kind of leadership. In fact, Jesus says, I did not come to be served, though I left the throne of God to be with you. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and to offer my life for all of you. And that's actually why I'm wearing this particular outfit today. Because Jesus says, if you want to follow me, if you want to be a part of my kingdom, get ready to put your serving clothes on, not your power clothes on. This is a t-shirt that I got from a mission trip that we went on as a bunch of folks, um, I think uh, actually to New Mexico, right? And so I am wearing my serving clothes this morning rather than a suit and tie, which is really more a symbol of power certain type of leadership. I'm here before you as a servant. So what does it have to do with friendship? What do these things reveal to us about friends? Now you might have noticed some things sifting through, but let me highlight a few of them. James and John come to Jesus and ask for something. And Jesus, instead of ridiculing them or demeaning them or saying, you don't even know what you're talking about, get out of here, he opens up a question for them to learn. Real friendship is shared in vulnerability. If you can't be vulnerable with your friends, who can you be vulnerable with? Nobody. When the disciples are vulnerable with Jesus, 
he doesn't ridicule them, but instead he seeks to tell them the truth about the way he's going to go and the way they need to go. It is a pure and holy gift to have a friend who will tell you the truth, especially when you don't want to hear it especially when you're going to run from it. How often, when someone tells us something we don't want to hear, do we shut all those people aside? No, thank you, I don't want to hear that. True friends welcome the truth in vulnerability and share it freely. And Jesus says, I'm going to take a cup and a baptism that's all about saving you being with you, going through all the hard stuff and all the dark stuff with you. Even though you don't get it, even though you don't know what's going on, I'm with you. Real friends, true friends will stick with you through the thick and thin, through the most difficult, suffering, dark, depressing times of your life, even when you don't get it and they seem to, they stick with you, they walk with you. And even more so, true friends will stick with you when things are going great. They don't get jealous. They don't get mad that it didn't happen to them. They stick with you through thick and thin. And finally, Jesus invites the disciples into a life of service True friendship is a life of service back and forth to each other. And that service is defined by humility, empathy, and compassion. If you have a friend in your life that exhibits those three qualities, humility, empathy, and compassion, you have a great gift. You have someone who is amazing in your life. And you should give thanks for that. Because they are living into that service that Jesus defined. So we celebrate friendship. And in it, we aspire to be those kinds of friends. Friends who are vulnerable when we don't know things and we need to tell the truth especially when that truth is hard. True friends are sticky. They stick with their people, their friends, their community, when they're suffering, when they're hurting, when they're celebrating. They stick with their friends. And true friends serve each other with humility, empathy, and compassion. They open themselves up to feel what the other is feeling. This is what we celebrate this morning. This is what we strive to be in our lives with our friends at school, with our friends at work, with our neighbors. May you be the kind of friend who is vulnerable in telling the truth. May you be a sticky friend, sticking with those who are going through hard times and sticking with those who are celebrating with joy. And may you be the kind of friend whose heart is filled with humility, empathy, and compassion. When we can be these kinds of friends, we see Jesus in our life all over the place. And we celebrate God's love and friendship. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for our friends, for those who are closest to us and those who are work friends or school friends, neighborhood friends, 
the people that we can share our deepest, darkest secrets with, and those who we have conversations with over lunch. We pray that you will make us the kind of friends that pattern ourselves after Jesus. Friends that tell the truth, that stick with each other, that have a spirit of humility, empathy, and compassion. Lord, thank you for our friends. We celebrate the ways that they are good and true and honest with us. And we pray that you will make us this kind of friends. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.